Our keynote speaker today, has anybody ever heard of Mr. Unger? Brian Unger, who's heard of him? Awesome, so we're gonna have some excitement in the room. I'm gonna be honest and say that I don't watch TV. Sorry, <laughs> but I have read lots about him. He's uh, pretty remarkable. I mean, an actor, a comedian, a writer, a producer. He's been in so many shows. He's been on NPR. Um, started off with uh, The Tonight Show as an intern. Is that right? Is that, it was a... The other one. The other one. The okay. Letterman Show. See, I, sh I should be reading this. Yes, yeah. See, and, and, and television, yeah. I'm usually out by then. Um, so he's, he's done some remarkable things. Um, he is going to talk to us today. Um, he's going to entertain us, um, and he's going to also give us some real-world points. So um, I want to welcome Brian to the stage. Um, we'll get you set up, and we're about five minutes early, but that's okay. We're all excited to see you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? <laughs> OK. This is fun. I like this. This is great. Um, good morning, Austin. I, I'm, I'm a little out of it because of the water situation. I guess you guys have this thing. And, and coffee is a commodity now. So I, I, first of all, can we give a round of applause for that tour de, tour de force performances that we saw this morning. I mean, yeah, you. Should I address you as Mr. Chairman? I mean, that was incredible. Thank you for warming up the room, first of all. Everyone is, um, I'm thinking Game of Thrones, maybe. I've got contacts at HBO. We can, like, hook you up. Did you do that? The Screen Actors Guild did call, though, while you guys were on here. They are not ready to issue any cards to any of you. Um, they, they, yeah, the union would like to put you on some sort of probation, and we'll go into that later. Um, <clears throat> good morning. I, I'm really happy to be there. Um, for those of you who don't know who the hell I am or don't watch television, which is very common these days, um, uh, let me give you a little bit of my history quickly. Um, I'm an actor and a writer and a producer. I'm also a journalist. I'm, I'm a journalist who, who acts, and um, I'm an acting journalist. I, I grew up in Ohio. I attended Ohio University. I moved to New York City. I became a producer at CBS News. Um, I then went on to help build The Daily Show at Comedy Central, where I was a founding producer and a correspondent. I then went on to produce and host shows for Discovery Channel. Um, History Channel, Travel Channel, and National Geographic. I was a commentator on National Public Radio for six years. Uh, and what I'm most proud of, um, I was fired as the anchor of Extra because I didn't kiss enough celebrity ass, I was told. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> to be a... Uh, to be more specific, um, the final straw was when I asked Keanu Reeves on the red carpet at the Matrix premiere um, if there would be a point break two. <laughs> <clears throat> and he said, what? <laughs> um, and his publicist just stepped in and said, Mr. Unger, we are out of time. So I deprived America of some pearl of wisdom from Keanu Reeves that night, and I was instantly fired. <laughs> Oh, boy, I'm really sorry about that, and my apologies uh, to America. Um, I'm a recurring character on, uh, uh, I play a lawyer on a show called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, cool, people watch TV, this is terrific. Um, I'm also a, a brain surgeon on a show called Yellowstone uh, on the Paramount Network. So basically we're talking about the jobs my mom wish I had. Um, and the ones that I guess I wish I had too. I like this. This is like we're, we're sort of like co-hosting. It's like a morning show. This is cool. Um, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Just, yeah. Um, most of the time, uh, I can be seen uh, cleaning my horse stalls and chicken coops and fixing the sprinkler system and just cursing loudly in my backyard. Um, in Los Angeles, that's where I live. You may have heard of it. It's a place that has no water. 
Um, so I've been a legitimate reporter at CBS and a fake comedy uh, reporter at Comedy Central. I've, I've been a real news anchor at MSNBC. Uh, I've been a fake news anchor on The Daily Show. Um, there's a term for people like me in the business, and it's called um, media whore. <laughs> I know. Early for that kind of language. It just created a Me Too situation, just for me. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm going to sue myself. I'll see myself in court. Um, a few years ago, um, I partnered uh, with an author uh, named Mark Stein, a New York Times bestselling writer who wrote a book called How the States Got Their Shapes. Um, Mark sent me the book because he thought it might make a great TV show. And so I sat down and I read it um, in the bathroom. And this is a perfect book for the bathroom. And I've told Mark that, and he's okay with that. Um, it has 50 chapters, depending on how you feel. You can do like, like two states in one shitting, sitting. Um, <laughs> or if you're in a hurry, you can just kind of zip through Vermont or Rhode Island. So if nothing else, the book was really practical. Now this feels awkward. Um, <laughs> I love the book, and I saw a lot of possibility for viewers, for them to think about how they saw themselves in their own states or bathrooms. You know, that's where most of us do our perfect thinking. We can probably advance the slide, I think. Oh, did... that's the best thinking part. <laughs> and we go to the next slide, I think. There we go. Thanks. Um... <laughs> oh, boy. Um... The challenge uh, for everyone in the making of how the states got their shapes, uh, making it into a TV show was pretty obvious. Um, as a book, it, it made sense to go state by state, chapter by chapter. It was dry, it was kind of boring. Um, but for a TV show, we needed a more dynamic structure with unifying themes uh, to use as the architecture. So we needed something more exciting, like, Cops, but for geography. I mean, I'm talking, you know, like seeing people like you being arrested in your underwear, like at night, late at night in your front yard. If you've ever seen Cops, that's what the show was about. Um, so we, we dissected the book and we put it back together again and we came up with some themes for the series. Um, that's me holding California. That's, that, can you go to the next slide? Sure That's better. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, our episode structure was, was fairly straightforward. Um, how the states were shaped by rivers, how transportation affected the shapes of our states, how Mother Nature affected uh, our states, war, religion, um, industry, the things that helped shape the nation, um, give states identity. Mostly it was about how shapes got their borders, on how those borders shaped us. Because it's always been a symbiotic relationship. We shape the states, the states shape us, they give us identity, we give the states identity. And the series really leaned heavily into geography in that first season, and we quickly found that while we were shooting, um, the lines on the map are really a story about people. And not just the people who drew the lines, but the people who, who live within them. And I don't have enough time, certainly, to take you all through, through every episode that we shot, and I won't do that to you, but I will share some of the adventures that, that uh, we experienced and, and shed some light on some of the things that we discovered that persist, that are enduring, um, that are a part of the nation's DNA, uh, central to, 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 to not just the formation of the states, but things that are embedded in the map around us all the time that affect our, our cultural, personal identities. Um, we started our journey up in Maine, way up in Maine, North Woods, near Millinocket, on a tiny island in the Northern Woods, an island um, on what's called Lake Ambejesus. Um, it was there I met a man named Chuck. I don't think he had a last name. There's Chuck. 
Um, he uh, lived in this boom house. Uh, the house was built in 1906. Uh, boom house is, is, uh, is uh, booms are the collection of lumber that, that form these circles in the water and they, they sort of lasso them. Um, it was a loggers camp there. And um, at one time, this, this was the largest lumber source in America. And here's Chuck, and Chuck was my first lesson on what it is to be an outlier. Uh, a term that we started applying frequently to some of the dreamers, the innovators, and the mavericks who shaped states' identities. And we, we gave a lot of thought to this. Um, how does one earn that moniker, outlier? What do they contribute to the country? And Chuck put it into terms that really, really brought it home for me and for our audience. It didn't make the show. Um, he said, uh, yeah, I guess I'm an outlier, Brian. Um, I live here alone. It's very remote, as you can see. I take the boat across the lake, and I go into town for only two reasons. To watch Bill O'Reilly and have sex with my wife. I mean, it's entirely possible if you think about it, because um, Bill O'Reilly was like off the air at 7. He could aboard a private plane at Teterboro, and he could fly to Millinocket by 10 and be in bed with Chuck's wife by like 11. <laughs> Not that I gave it any thought at all. Um, <laughs> we found many, many outliers in our travels in America. Outliers all had very limited contact with population centers. Um, they had a deep skepticism toward city folk and organized government, despite many of them being on some sort of federal program or federal aid. Um, they tended to watch conservative media, and they were all having sex with Chuck's wife. It was the weirdest <laughs> thing. Um, you can get Shaq in here or, or the guy who invented like the post-it notes. It's not too late if you... If you <laughs> Okay, it is too late. Um, not, surpri <laughs> not surprising, we, we, we talked a lot about water in Maine and how the glaciers had carved out those, that beautiful landscape there. I mean, it's unbelievable and deposited such a, an abundant supply of water for a state in, in, and created these amazing aquifers and springs. And, and, and as a Southern Californian, I was truly envious. Um, our journey then moved into the south from there, and no. ah, you can keep it there. Um, and I began to pick up on a new current uh, that was not just skepticism toward city folk, but also toward media folk, the media. Um, now, that wasn't an entirely new thing to me. As the first correspondent on The Daily Show, um, I had experienced that friction between me as a member of the media and an outlier. My crew and I were up in uh, Ontario Bay, Canada, and I was there to do a story on a man who had built a suit that would enable him to um, survive a grizzly bear attack. Uh, that's uh, him right there. That's Troy Hurtabees. I'm only going to say his name because he's passed, and I'm still terrified of him to this day. Um, <laughs> Troy was a really proud inventor, and uh, Troy just had this wild dream that he wanted to basically build a suit that would allow him to go into a, a cave where a bear, a grizzly bear, was hibernating. And he wanted to videotape that bear <laughs> hibernating. <laughs> and then when the bear would, would awaken, Troy would be there with a camera in his, in his suit, that's the Mark VI, he called it, and, he would, and then the bear would wake up and see Troy there, and then, and then I, I guess the, tro the bear would say, like, what the hell are you doing here, <laughs> and try to rip Troy to, to many thousands of pieces. Um, that was the objective, and we've all had that in our lives, so don't judge. Um, <laughs> Troy took out a second mortgage on his home. 
He spent every penny that he had and he built that suit. And I asked him why he wanted to do this and he never really gave me a clear answer, but I'm, I'm piecing together that he had experienced some trauma as a child that involved a bear. Um, I think it, it was something like he met a grizzly as a kid. In, in, he met a bear in the woods when he was young and he peed his pants. And, and, and we've all done that too. So um, what drives a guy though to spend every cent he has on a bear suit, you know, I'll, I'll never really truly know. But um, getting back to the resentment of press and the media, um, the press looks at outliers in America and everywhere in the world really as um, different. And outliers see the press as mostly disrespectful. Um, it's just an energy. Um, and in other times, it's just the stupid stuff that journalists say. Um, Troy's situation turned pretty bleak, actually. Um, his wife left him, uh, took their kid. Uh, worst of all, the suit was repossessed by the bank. Yeah. Now, for me to make this story make any sense, I needed pictures of the suit. So I, I, had to, I wanted to bring the crew and shoot the suit, but the suit was in the bank. Um, and it was in a vault in the bank. So we had to pay the bank to open uh, after hours. We had to bring a bank employee there. Um, and we, we had to, it was really involved and a really sensitive negotiation. And we had to pay cash to do all of this. I don't know why, but we had to like pay a bank manager cash. And it, and it was just, it, it, the whole thing felt, it was already very sensitive and weird. And I just need a picture of the Mark VI. Um, so I bring Troy into the vault, and we light the suit very dramatically. Um, and I interview Troy there, and it's very emotional for him to see the suit. He hadn't seen it in a long time. It had been in the vault, and there it was, locked away. And just me and the tr Troy, the suit, and the producer, and the cameraman. And mind you, this was The Daily Show, not 60 Minutes. So I thought it'd be, <laughs> I thought it'd be really, really cute and funny uh, to say, hey, Troy, do you have like scheduled visits with the suit? <laughs> like at night, do you ever, are you allowed to come in and just sort of gaze at the suit and, and does the suit gaze back at you and you get to see it? And he said, yeah. And then I thought, well, this will be even funnier and cuter to say. I said, uh, Troy, do you get conjugal visits with the suit? <laughs> I know it's early, you guys, but the, like these are after three jokes, but I, I parts of the story. But um, uh, he, uh, he, he looked at me and he paused and he said, yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, you know, I get, uh, I come in here and uh, you know, spend some time in here. It's really nice. Uh, and you know, it's not the best situation, but uh, you know, I, yeah, I do. And I said, holy crap, we just got comedy gold. We're done. <laughs> so I look at my producer and the camera, I think we're good. I, everybody is starting to kind of pack up and Troy feels really good about himself and the suit feels really good about itself. And I, I was walking toward the vault door and just as I was turning to leave, um, there was this like really goofy friend of his, uh, his buddy, a uh, tall, skinny guy, and he kind of poked his head in, and he said, hey, Troy, did you hear what that asshole just said to you? And Troy said, uh, no, what? He said, did you, you, he said, did you, he said to you, uh, are you banging the suit? <laughs> and uh, everybody just froze. And I don't know if you can see what's on his shoulder. <laughs> it's literally a chip on his shoulder, but he carries a giant hunting knife. And he reached up and he touched the knife and he said, what did you say to me? And I, I just froze several lifetimes, like flashed before my eyes. And I just said, without even thinking, oh my God, is that what conjugal means? <laughs> I am so sorry, I don't, I'm in the media, we just read what they tell us to. I didn't even, 
I, I turned to my producer. I, did you put conjugal in there? I ca that cannot stand. We are editing that out. I am so sorry, Troy. <laughs> and Troy just like, the air, it just deflated in the room and he just said, okay, cool. I thought you were making fun of me there. I said, I would never do anything like that. I'm furious about this. Um, outliers in America don't like the media mostly because of the way we talk to them. <laughs> Getting back to the States, as I mentioned, we headed south and we took a look at the Mason-Dixon line, of course. Um, we also took a look at the Tennessee-Georgia border, particularly about um, how the northern border is off in Georgia by about a quarter mile. And you probably already know this, right? You don't know this? Am I at the right place? Some might know we're in no, no, I know you're in Texas. I know Texas is its own republic. I get it. I got the whole thing. <laughs> one, of the, one of the things I love about Texas is, uh, there are many things I love about Texas, but um, one of the things that was just a running joke with our crew was to ask every Texan, so, so if you mess with Texas, what, what happens? <laughs> and people would just laugh, and then, and then we'd say, no, 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 really, we really need to know what happens. And they would, everyone said, we'll kick your ass. <laughs> The, and I also, <laughs> and that uh, Texas has its own power grid. That's what I like too. They were very proud of the fact that, well, if the East Coast goes out and the West Coast goes out, we got our lights on. Hey. Um, sorry. Uh, um, there is agreement, though, generally uh, among surveyors um, and analysts that this border is off in Georgia and Tennessee. Everybody agrees. Um, it, it, it really wouldn't matter that much if it weren't for this lake, I think you can go to the next one, Lake Nickajack, which is a, uh, a beautiful lake that is within that quarter mile, um, which would really help Atlanta out. Um, Georgia gets more rain than any other state in the union, believe it or not, but they have a bedrock found. None of the water can run off to anywhere. They have no way to collect it. It's a terrible situation that Atlanta experiences as it grows. So we, we were there, and, and it's literally like a chip shot from uh, Georgia to Tennessee, and we actually like fired some golf balls into the lake, and it was really cinematic and beautiful. And, uh, the, 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 and, and Georgia really, really, really wants this water, and they're trying to get the border changed a little bit. And I think the governor of Tennessee said, I'd love to help out, and sent a truck of bottled water to the governor. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, so we're standing, um, uh, uh, we're, we're going around Tennessee, and we're asking people about this border discrepancy. And we were in a, in a little town um, in East Tennessee, and I was standing on a street corner. It was like one of those towns with one light, I'm um, standing outside a bar and I'm talking to folks about how they feel about the border and a young, young woman wearing bib overalls, I could hear a banjo in the distance as I saw her coming. <laughs> I can get in trouble for stuff like that now, right? And then she rides up and um, she says to me, we don't need you telling our stories and then she spit on me. And up until that moment, I'd, I'd been a spit virgin. I had never had any, other than like Alicia Patterson in the fifth grade, who was the worst kisser ever, I had never had a woman just like throw her spit on me. Um, uh, and, and, and it was also the first time that I had been wounded in action as a journalist. Um, um, I took a direct hit to my face. Um, and, and she rode away and the crew laughed and they thought that was really funny. Are you, I know, it's happened to you, everybody experiences that at some time too. And I, it's terrible, I'll never forget it. Um, she said, uh, uh, the mucus part went away. I, I was really, really struck by what she said. We don't need you telling our stories. And I started thinking about that and I realized that geography is personal. It's about stories 
but geography belongs to the people who call the geography home. It's, there's an ownership relationship there to the land and the line. Um, stories are embedded in those lines on the map and in the people who live there, and they tell us who we are and where we came from. They define us, and that's deeply personal and cultural. So we have to tell stories about geography very carefully and with great sensitivity. Um, there's a cultural geography that is always in play wherever we travel, wherever we go, in every part of the country. Um, this was particularly true when we went out west. Um, we were in a remote part of Montana for part of the show to explore how gun culture is different there than it is in other places in America. We were way, way, way out in the Montana countryside, the, the, the wilderness, as some people would say. And we interviewed a man who had moved there from Brooklyn, New York. And he explained to me um, the reason why he had so many guns and manufactured gun parts and shipped them to people. Um, he said, for whatever reason that he might need to call a sheriff, it would take them an hour and a half to get to his property. And so he wore something very understated on his belt. <laughs> a really intimidating guy, and I understand um, that, you know, the geography colored his perspective on the world, his geography, his cultural views, his politics in a very specific way. Um, I think we can go to the next one. It also, um, in a not so practical way, this is his trailer. Yeah, uh, that didn't make the cut either, sorry. Um, we, we talked to people in California secessionist movement. We talked to people in the Texas secessionist movement, the DC inclusion movement, the Puerto Rico inclusion movement, we found so many Americans are still looking to establish their identities in their geography in a country that is 235 years old. Um, in all, we put about 50,000 miles on our little Subaru, um, exploring America's geography and the people who live in it and, and the people um, who live under it. Uh, this guy lived in an abandoned ICBM missile silo in Kansas. Uh, I guess the U.S. Air Force was too lazy to remove all the launch hardware for their nuclear missiles. Uh, so there was an actual launch console in his house um, and it had a launch book with all the codes in it still in binders. And then there was the launch button, which, which was a real thrill to simulate launch, uh, just annihilating the world. Um, and just standing there. The man also invited us to his drum circle that night, um, which sent every really big dude on my crew running for the Holiday Inn Express. Like, we have to get out of this man's silo. Um, when we were finished with that first season, uh, can we go to the next one? We had discovered something significant. And as I said, I can't take you through the whole series and the whole show. Uh, to, 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 I think you might appreciate this better if, if some of you have seen the show, maybe you know what I mean. Um, but we discovered something that, 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 that ironically we couldn't really talk about. <laughs> the conclusion that we reached was something that we really couldn't say when you work for a company called History Channel that's owned by NBC and speaks to as many Americans as possible. Um, it sounded like kind of a downer. Um, but that wasn't the downside. What, 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 what we had learned truly just wasn't promotable. It wasn't something that we could just put on package with pictures and it wouldn't, with great music and sound, like, yeah, I gotta see that show. Um, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't do it. So I, 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 um, I'm gonna share what I learned with you um, because I do that with, with rooms like this because I'm not on television and it, it's more intimate. Um, but here's what we learned. Um, we are chronically, but beautifully, permanently divided. 
Good night. <laughs> um, uh, um, we always have been. Uh, where we are today in America is no exception. Um, but here's what's so terrible to say when you're promoting the show. Um, we are, in essence, the dis United States. Um, really patriotic sounding, isn't it? Um, we have borders and boundaries and lines, the things that are written and codified into our maps that divide us, that keep us separate, that keep us other from one another. Those um, are man-made lines, and there are the rivers and the lakes and the mountains, the stuff that Mother Nature made. Um, and then there are the people, uh, the traditions, the customs, all specific to every region, right? Um, the things that keep people in, the things that keep people out, we struggle with that daily. Um, and ironically, those are the lines that, that, that are intrinsically movable and alterable, but we, we struggle with that every day. We are not a perfect union. In fact, we're far from it. We might not ever be, but in that idea is what makes this country, this experiment, so great. That's what we found. And while it might be chronic, it's not fatal. Um, I'm going to come back to that and talk about why it feels and sounds so fatal sometimes. But state's author Mark Stein and I started thinking, what's the next iteration of how the states got their shapes? What are we going to do for the next season? Because um, we've kind of said everything already, in a way. What can we say that we didn't say? Haven't we already told you that Florida looks like a, 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 a dangling male anatomy? We had people draw that on a screen, and it was just embarrassing every time, so we just cut it out. Uh, haven't we already told you why Oklahoma has a panhandle, why California is hopelessly too big? You know, what's left for us to say? Well, there's something very human about the lines on the map. And first, we start with, with someone who drew them. I mean, no kid ever said, when I grow up, I'm going to draw a state line. But someone did and inexorably divided the nation. And then there are the people who live in our states today who proudly wear the colors, who speak the dialects, they're connected to the food, the sports, and so much more. You all know the identifiers. Mark and I wondered, can we draw a line, a timeline from the person or persons who drew the lines in order to establish a specific set of principles, morality, or statehood? Can you draw a line from those line drawers to the people who live inside those lines today? What's the connection? How do the people who live in Ohio reflect the values and the purpose of the people who first drew Ohio? Are they the same? Is there any trace of the original master plan for Rhode Island, let's say? We wanted to dive down, and we will dive down into this human story of the lines. And I suppose that's the little bit of news I'm breaking today, is that there's going to be another season of how the states got their shapes. Um, thank you for that smattering of applause from that gentleman. Thank you, and you, and you. Let's hang out later. Cool. Um, we outlined, Mark, I'm going to give you a preview, 10 of the most significant things that uh, human things that have shaped our map and that we are going to explore. People did it for votes, gerrymandering. The map uh, is constantly changing. Our communities are constantly changing the borders from Thomas Jefferson to present. Um, people did it for land. We're going to talk about the Louisiana Purchase and other big land grabs in America, lines on the map that remain to this day. It's all about the real estate. Uh, people did it for the money. Um, we're focusing specifically on the people who drew lines to divide and unite over slavery, the efforts today to redraw state lines for reasons emanating from the culture clash of the Civil War that are still enduring. They did it for God. People drew lines to protect particular religious communities. And in doing so, they helped those communities feel united with the United States. They did it for their race, people who sought unsuccessfully in every case, to create states 
to protect Native Americans, African Americans, and white supremacists. Communities that today struggle with their identity while seeking to feel united with other Americans. They did it again. The all-stars of state line creation, people who contributed to the greatest number of state lines and are fighting to change them today. They did it because they were a woman. Though men long sought to exclude women from shaping the nation, we want to reveal that the continuing struggle by women for equal rights also include uh, battles in which state lines are at stake and were at stake. They did it for the power, powerful interest groups, uh, drew state lines revealing that such string pullers are not new to the United States, nor disunited from it. They did it because they had a dream. People uh, who sought to expand the borders of the United States raising questions of community and unity that continue to this day, most notably regarding the notion of Puerto Rico statehood. Um, and finally, they did it their way. Um, individuals through just sheer will who single-handedly established a state line and singularly impacted the borders. Who are these people then and now? How are they connected? And let's take Rhode Island, as I mentioned earlier. Roger Williams. The conventional wisdom is that Roger Williams founded Rhode Island for religious freedom, which is true, but not because he was some, you know, loosey-goosey liberal. Rather, it was because the Puritan Reverend Williams was too pure for the Puritans of Massachusetts, so they kicked him out. How religious freedom unfolded from this ultra-Puritan guy turns a lot of the conventional wisdom about that community on its ear. And Mark and I started thinking about the ironies that are built into our borders. Imagine a state formed for the purpose of being purer than Puritans. And what, if anything, of that religious purity remains today? Well, 54.6% of the people in Rhode Island are religious. 45% of them are Catholic. It is the most Catholic state in America. Why? We want to connect the human lines in the next outing of this series. Which brings me back to this idea of us all being so divided, so disunited, and that feeling we have. Um, first of all, uh, Kathleen, how many people do you have in your family? Yeah. Five. Okay. So if all five of you in the same room, do you all agree on everything at all, all the time? Yeah. Never. So do you all have the same views about, let's say, the economy? Do you share the same views on reproductive rights, gun ownership? No. Maybe? No? Mostly, though, generally speaking, it would be a conversation. Yeah, OK. Um, you don't all think the same way. Um, now imagine, Kathleen, you have 50 members in your family. Um, you're all in one room. And that would be a nightmare of a family, I know, uh, 50 of you. The point is. I don't know any of us who all think the same way, even though, even in our own families, we share the same name. We still don't think the same way. Um, so we have this republic of ours, uh, 50 unique individual freestanding states with their own identities and views on just about everything in the world, but we are all Americans. And we all know this. Most of us are proud of the states we're from. Um, because we carry that torch, right, for life. Um, I mean, listen to two strangers on any airplane, and the conversation is so familiar, right? Um, they start talking about uh, their homes, their towns, their states. They compare, they contrast. It can last for hours, depending on the flight, but mostly the co it's about the contrast, the well-worn conversation. We can hear it in our ear. It's customary for us to go through this, all of it really demonstrating an underlying pride in where we come from and how different we are from someone else, or how tribal we are and similar we are to the people who live with us. It defines us. So when that goes beyond 18 minutes on a plane, I would advise you just to ask for another seat. Um, but we know this, and, and you know also um, that, that 
There is one particular group that is very, very aware of these contrasts of, from state to state. Uh, this, this disunion, we feel, every day, the push-pull that we have as states, uh, the rub, as it were. And, and who reflects this back to us the most? Um, the news media. I know them. I'm one of them. <laughs> And, and why, do we, why do we project it and why do we hear it so much? And you know this too, because disharmony and disunion sells. It sells digestive enzymes, laxatives, psoriasis medication, detergent, lawyers who will represent you if you get you know, mesothelioma. Um, you name the malady, disunion is good for the economy, uh, the media economy. It makes money, and it is inescapable. Um, even when we're not even paying attention, when we're not looking at television, it's online. It's ubiquitous. Um, and I'm not talking about fake news, that whole Michigas, or the noise about facts and alternative facts. I'm talking about the profit drive to get your eyeballs and clicks. Across all media, every single day, we're reminded of how different we are. Um, Count how many maps you see every day, not in your work, outside of your office, that are constantly reminded, reminding us that we're divided. Um, will you go to the, the next? Here, here are a few I pulled just, just like in a given week. I just pulled just like a bunch. That's like seven days right here um, from a range of publications. Here's the obvious one that we see and we're reminded of in our American journey every day. Every single day, not just but by, by the media, but by our president, right? He's very proud of this map. Um, he likes to remind us of it. If I were him, I would like get a tattoo on my back of this thing. I mean, he might already. Um, obviously, you know what this is. This is our red-blue divide in the 16 election. Um, the next one, here's a map of um, who gets hurt by tariffs. This separates us by economy, what we make, what our jobs are, what we do, what we're very proud of, what identifies us. Um, here's another one. Here's the definitive map of the most visited restaurant cuisine in America. Um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I see a coming war between Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. I, I, I don't know what side will you be on. I would think about that. Um, here's another map. This is the largest employers in America. I don't really notice anything prominent there, do you? I, I don't really see anything. Um, here's another map. This is where I live um, in Southern California. It shows how much people will earn as adults if they were raised in any of these areas. So the green, the darker green colors are meaning that as adults you'll be more affluent. And then there's this really cursed block right there by Nordoff, and I still don't know why it looks like everything else, but imagine growing up there and seeing that and knowing that when you grow up, you'll learn less than all the other people around you. Um, here's a map that I saw. Um, this is, I, if you type in a state name into Google or Yahoo, followed by um, the word is, this is what you'll get. Um, so like Florida is, and the search response will be crazy. <laughs> I love, Texas is on fire. I don't, I don't really, uh, um, I, I tried this and some of them are actually correct and then others are not. Um, West Virginia is racist. I mean, I'm, it's just like, it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that internet, you know, I'll tell you. All those facts that just come right out of there for you. Yeah, I believe everything. Um, the media loves to remind us how divided things are um, because of, of the fact that dissonance is drama. Um, it rates. It pays. Think about the alternative for just a second. Imagine Rachel Maddow or Sean Hannity going on the air and saying, good evening, everybody. In America, everyone's getting along, living in harmony, and in breaking news, the Aggies and the Longhorns have formed a single team. 
because of their mutual love for one another. That's all we have for you today. Good night. Pretty boring. It doesn't really sell. Um, so it begins to feel that all this disunion is not just chronic, that it's, like I said, fatal. That somehow the republic is going to die if we don't fix it, this disharmony we feel. And it, and it just doesn't seem that anyone can implement a solution for it. So it self-perpetuates. Um, that the republic is in trouble, that we need to sort of circle the wagons, that we need to grab our pitchforks and torches and head to the town square immediately. There is a sense of panic and this fear generated by the media industrial complex, which is so profitable, it can foster distrust and fatigue with regard to not just media, but also how our politicians who are all trying to message, motivate, manipulate, I'm not certain, but I think this is part of the reason a girl riding up on her bike spits on me in the street. Um, people feel scared when you start messing with their geography. And media and politicians take advantage of that, that populist fear, and they use it as a cudgel. Uh, geography has been weaponized. I hate that word, but it's just one more thing in our culture that's been weaponized. What you do has now been turned into a weapon for the right people who can figure out how to analyze it and to message it. It feels like North versus South all over again. Bible Belt versus Beltway, Rust Belt versus the Coast, Midwest versus the elites, rich versus poor, white versus black versus Hispanic versus Middle Eastern, and within certainly those geographies, it's men versus women, straights versus gays, on and on and on. And so Mark Stein and I have been asking, um, and this is what we want to find out, and, and we want to find out in the next States series, what it is that holds us together. What are the things that keep the union strong? Keep us as one country, not 50. Because it would be easy to go back to those Civil War era days, and there are even people who are enjoying sentiments and would like to pull us back there, but we don't. And we won't. Why? Yeah, we have a binding constitution. Thankfully, this document that gives us this one-size-fits-all framework. But what are the values in it that hold us together and keep the United States united? I mean, if we're so divided, what's the glue that keeps us stuck with one another? Because we really are stuck with one another. Just like Kathleen, you are stuck with your family. I'm sorry. Or your neighbors, or the town next door, the county across the ridge, the state over the river, the nation on your border. We're stuck with each other. What makes America great? I think you can go to the next slide. I don't know what that is. I think that's in North Dakota. What makes America great is the unity that comes from mostly opposing communities. It's a paradox, a little dichotomy. It's just something inherently not supposed to work, but somehow we make it all work. And we stay together in a country of lines that are man-made, some of them natural, lines that are constantly evolving and being redrawn for all of us, sometimes for all of us, sometimes for just a few people, for some of us, that redefine where we live and how we define ourselves in our geography. We want to explore how we arrive at these definitions for what it is to be of Texas, of Ohio, of Wyoming, of the United States, et cetera. Why is Austin weird? Well, why is there a movement to keep it weird? Why is that important? 
because it is. There's something in the DNA there. Who drew our lines and who draws them today? And what basis do we go by to redraw them? Is it data? Is it science? Money? Power? Nostalgia? Myth? Fear? Protectionism? Or nationalism? The stories Mark and I want to explore are the stories of people that demonstrate the unity of sometimes opposing communities. And to hear those stories, you're going to have to watch the next season at a place I can't tell you yet, but it's coming. Um, I want to thank you so much for letting me come and speak to you and sharing some of this experience. I know this has gone on long, and I probably talked too long. Did I talk too long? OK. Um, I think that the work that you do is very important, underappreciated, if people only knew uh, what you apply to their lives every day that they're so unaware of. Um, and so on behalf of this guy who's kind of like you know, a pedestrian in the world of geography, and Mark, who's a professor of history, thank you to all of you. Um, I appreciate it. And um, if you remember anything that I said uh, at all today, um, if, you, if you take anything from this rambling speech that I've given you today, um, the definition of conjugal is <clears throat> relating to the married state or to married persons and their relations. I know this now. <laughs> Thank you for the work you do. Thank you. What's that? I would, yeah, I would love to answer some questions. If anybody cares. I'd... We have a little bit of time for questions, so if anybody wants to ask questions, uh, Jeff back there will uh, toss you a box, and you can speak into the box. Jeff, where would you Behind like to you. start? I've got, I've got three over here. Sometimes people don't you... have questions, and then I just go like, okay, see you throw, Can somebody catch it and then throw it to Scott? Uh, so there you okay? go, Scott. <laughs> Do we have a situation? We're lazy. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's, oh I see go. you passed the box. Which and, side of it? Okay. Oh, this side. Uh, Thank you for defining uh, <laughs> conjugal. Uh, for conjugal? Yeah, conjugal. Yeah, you bet. Appreciate that. Yep. Thank you. That's right. I was right. wondering. And uh, how did Troy die? Oh, it's sad. He got into a car accident. Oh. Um, I know. And, 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 and <laughs> I was hoping it was a bear. I, I feel so, yeah. He did, uh, after the March 6, he abandoned uh, any effort to catch a bear hibernating. And he went to the next logical uh, thing. He wanted to cure male pattern baldness. So he developed a series of lasers um, that um, this contraption, you can look it up online, you can see it. He goes to this 15 minute explanation of it. I mean, the guy was just a, an inspired inventor, but just clearly um, off his rocker and had a, a knife that he could well, really. I'm, I'm glad you survived the encounter. Thanks, man. I am too. Who's next? You, you know what we did, just quickly, once we got done shooting, we canceled our hotel reservation and drove to the airport and flew out of town that <laughs> night. And he said, what channel are you, what show are you on again? And I said, I'm on the Todaily show. You know, one with Matt Lauer? That guy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I like that show. Kim, did you have a question? It's going way over there. Can somebody catch it? And Let's start here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, my question regards the uh, boundary between Texas and Oklahoma. I just oh God. Yeah, so you are aware of the uh, conundrum there, that the, the long history and then the recent development where the BLM was wanting to actually develop perhaps wildlife areas, wildlife management area between the two states, because there is federal or Indian land on that border, mm -hmm. and uh, Oklahoma wanted it actually, but Texas did not. They were, you know, very against that. And it's, it's personal for me because we own a ranch on that boundary. And my mother yeah, was actually on, on a boundary commission uh, once upon a time. But it is kind of one of those interesting yeah. state versus state versus feds yeah. in this case. 
And to add a little bit of sauce to the thing, there's actually even a Texas county in Oklahoma, which mm -hmm. is kind of mm -hmm. interesting. But. And, and so you, you, can, you understand then the, the personal nature of that land, the border, the line. And what I learned too is that to change these borders takes an act of, <laughs> takes an act of both houses of Congress and the Supreme Court to change a line on the map now. Um, and probably the agreement of all flag manufacturers and, or something <laughs> like that, I'm guessing, lobbyists. But I mean, think about how impossible it would be to change the line. I mean, we can't get Congress to, to, to even come to work. I mean, <laughs> and the Supreme Court wouldn't, they would refuse to hear the case anyway. Um, so my guess is. So, you know, we're, 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 we're left to work these out regionally and with state government and to, and it just seems like a perpetuating sort of kind of thing that we never really settle them. And in that case, you know, these, the DNA of the Wild West, I heard crickets on a phone, which is, <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, I'm getting off. <laughs> subtle, very subtle. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, 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 so um, in that way, the West is still the Wild West. I mean, I met with the, the secessionist movement in Northern California is, is just, it's incredible. I mean, these are, that's the state of Jefferson. They call themselves, they're convinced they're going to cut themselves off from the rest of the state. It tries to get, they try to get on the ballot. They're trying to get on the, but they were trying to get on the ballot in November, but it's all related to, to economies. It's an old mining region. They don't mine anything there anymore. Our leadership hasn't cultivated new, profitable, enduring businesses that kind of utilize the talent and the people there. They feel disenfranchised. They feel disconnected. They feel angry. They hate Sacramento. That in turn is anger toward Washington. That's a very common thing we found. People are really pissed off about Washington in the West generally speaking. They don't want any part of that centralized government. And that's very much rooted in the state's formation, how those states came to be. People left the East, they went to the West, they went to gold mine and, and silver mine and all these other things, but there's still a resentment toward Washington, um, despite reaping all of the benefits that a centralized government gives them, interstates, healthcare, um, social security, and so on. So I think clearly information, supplying information, training people, and regionally in this specific case, you know, it's a tough thing. I don't know. No, the, I don't think we'll ever know the answer. Well, the Texans think the problem's solved, but it's not. I mean, the mm -hmm. Congress jumped in, they think they got a resolution, but we haven't gotten a deed to that land, so it's, mm -hmm. you know, then I would take it with violence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Way over there. Somebody catch it. We, we got to send it way over there. I like this this thing. I need that in my family. That. <laughs> yeah. How do I speak now? You can just set it right. Can you hear me? Yeah. You yeah. can set it we right. We can. Yes. Well, yeah. you know, I really appreciate you traveling all over this, the states and where besides California. Would you like to move and stay there because that has your values? That's a really good question, and I've been thinking about this too. Um, and, and it's another thing that, that we're getting into in the next iteration of the show. We have 50 choices about where we can live, which is like this incredible idea when you think about it. Because those places we choose to live in are reflective of our values and our identities, but like how we feel about the world, like what tribe do you want to sign up with, basically. I'm with like this SoCal tribe of people. We're all kind of, you know, similar-ish in our, you know, we share values is what I'm trying to say. And in California, we share values, right? Just like you do as Texans, you share certain things that make you Texan. Um, so I would have to pick a state, I guess, that reflected the idea that, that, that creativity and ideas are a currency that are as valued as money. 
That, I, I would have to find that state. So where is that state? Other than say like where I feel kind of at home in California. We have so much innovation in Northern California. There's so much creativity in Southern California. Um, I also like to work in the dirt. I have horses. I like getting on a horse and riding off without anyone telling me to get off their land. I like living near an Angel or I live in Angeles National Forest, so I, I have national park land. I don't know, you know, it reflects who I am. Where would I go? I, I, I haven't, you know, it's more often than not, you travel to a state where you go, I don't want to live here. <laughs> so I'd stay wet, I'd stay in West. I, I enjoy New Mexico a lot. And I think that Montana and Wyoming and Utah are just staggeringly beautiful. And I love that. Um, so I would have to convert to Mormonism if I go to Utah. I'm, you know, we have a Mormon? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you're, uh, Where are you? I'm over here. Uh, oh, there we go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he actually got the cue for me. So I don't have my I glasses on either, so I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, your, your concept of what makes us all the same has sort of already been used. Uh, the, all the cooking shows, we all eat. In every one of these cooking shows, it's, it's the celebration of your culture through your food. So much so. You are so right, and that's why Hollywood loves cooking shows. Yeah. They rate because people feel like they can sit down at a table together. It's the one thing we do well together, we eat uh, well together. I mean, whatever our political differences, and Anthony Bourdain demonstrated that better than anybody. I mean, what a career all over the world, how you can sit down at a table with someone with different religious views, political views. You can take someone from Palestine, you can take someone from Israel, and put them at a table and they can eat and share stories about their families. And when they get up from the table, they go back to fighting. You know, um, yeah, those cooking shows are really sort of a microcosm of what, what we're trying. The food reflects our identity, right? The ingredients come from a place. The very molecular structure of food defines your makeup, which is very, the line is very connected. If you go into uh, the South, I mean, think about how people talk about food. If you go to uh, Carolinas, you talk about the rice, Carolina gold rice, and the geography that grew the rice, and the people whose fathers, fathers, fathers grew the rice. And then you go sit down in a restaurant today, and they, it's there on the menu, Carolina gold rice with a whole bunch of other great things, okra, and all the, all the other great foods of the South are there on your plate. And that tells a story, and that story is about the people and their history. So food is this, like, wonderful connector, um, you know, for sure. Hello. Hi. I'm right here. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> I see you. And you don't um, look weird at all talking into an orange square. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you what my opinion is in a minute. But, Please. Um, I'm curious about yours. Because mine is only mine. <laughs> um, where do you think, you know, which state do you think is the friendliest state? Friendliest? Yeah, the people are the friendliest, yeah. Uh, Canada? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's funny, if you dig a little deeper, within every state you find the chip on the shoulder, the resentment of something or, or the unfriendly quality of, of somewhere. Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I would say that the, the, the friendliest state that I, that I went to, um, it would have to be probably Minnesota. I'll give you that. <laughs> I think yeah, the same thing I don't thing know what, what are the Nordic folk are just like, 
I, you know, I think it's rooted in, in that old Midwestern, the, the, the DNA of everyone is polite. Uh, they, they, they are, everyone says yes to everything. Uh, they're constantly offering you something to drink uh, or food or, or something, and, and they will never allow you to say no. Michigan also, uh, I just, just, I'm so, it's so nice you just want to say, get away from me. <laughs> Could someone be mean to me, please? Uh, it is not New York, and it's not New York City. Um, New York City is one of the m most communal places I've ever been in my life. I've lived there for 16 years. Um, it has to be, because we're like this with one another, rubbing shoulders and stuck in subways together. And, but, um, and then there are a lot of places that are very standoffish. I think California is very cold and distant, despite the sunny, warm, sort of outgoing extroversion image that it has. Uh, I find people are pretty isolated in their own worlds, mainly because we're just sitting on the 405 all day. <laughs> just, you know. What was your opinion that you wanted to share? Well, I lived for 10 years in Montana. Mm. And um, be, even before I moved there, and it, in fact, it factored into the decision to go there in some small way. but. Um, I always felt the people were super friendly there mm -hmm. before I moved there and while I was there. Yeah. And they do share that, you know, some of that, the same type of people, the Scandinavian influence that, uh -huh. you know, that, that whole, like you have up on the screen, the, that whole region, northern United States. But also I think what happens in Montana is in the West, um, people are so isolated that they have to rely on one another. And mm -hmm. so, again, it's, they're their geography is, is playing into their, their culture and the way that they are. Yeah, and, and with isolation comes the problem of media not doing its job because the only messaging they're getting is sometimes by watching, let's say, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, or whatever. And so the messages become the only messages that are getting into some of these areas where they're, they're not exposed to, to more broader, diverse um, communities. And, and so, um, you know, they're more susceptible sometimes to messaging, and I'm not criticizing the people. I'm just saying that the more messages you have, the more patterns you can form to sort of weed through what is fact and fiction. And so I think it, it, they were very nice to us, but I, I do think that generally when you show up with a camera in Montana, I remember we went to a gun show, uh, and they asked us where we were from all the time. We were with the History Channel. And when we left... You do left, get that a lot in Montana. We'll what's that? that? Where are you from? Where, in Montana. You oh, do get that a lot in Montana. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, 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 and as soon as you say... Well, first of all, they look at me, and they're like... Jewish? Gay? Both? What? <laughs> straight? What? What's your deal? Everything's kind of, what's your deal? Um... And, and um, we went to this gun show, and when we left, they, a guy came out, and he said, you know what they all think in there? And I said, no. <laughs> what? He said, they think you're undercover for the FBI. <laughs> and I was like, OK, cool. Tell them thank you. So we actually are out of time for questions. Oh, good. Um, I, 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 we, we gotta, I, I'll sit down. We got to go to break. You guys Sorry, have to go to the bathroom and do things. Around? Are you going to stick around? I, I have a little bit of time. Yeah, okay. I do. Okay, so uh, we'll go to break. Um, we really enjoyed you, Brian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll see you all back at 10.